Uh, good evening and uh, welcome to the Spring 2013 Dean Helen LeBaron Hilton Endowed Chair Lecture. Uh, my name is Robert Bossman. I serve as Chair of the Department of Apparel Events and Hospitality Management in the College of Human Sciences. And we are the 2012-2013 hosts for the Hilton Endowed Chair. The individual selected for the Dean Helen LeBaron Hilton Endowed Chair is someone who is visionary and exemplifies the integrative, holistic, synergistic focus of the vision and themes of our College of Human Sciences in advancing the well-being of all people. Dr. Paul Wapner is a professor in the School of International Service at American University in Washington, D.C. Dr. Wapner served as director of the Global Environmental Politics Program at AU from 1998 to 2011. He holds a doctoral and master's degree in politics from Princeton and a master's in political science from University of Chicago. He also studied at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Dr. Wapner's research focuses on environmental thought, transnational environmental activism, environmental ethics, and global environmental politics. He's the author of Living Through the End of Nature, The Future of American Environmentalism, and Environmental Activism in World Civil po Civ Civic Politics, which received the Harold and Margaret Sprout Award for Best Book on International Environmental Affairs. I believe that those are available over there if you're interested. And tonight he's going to talk to us about the subject of climate suffering. He's traveled uh, quite a bit this year on his sabbatical, and I know he's got a lot of things to, to share with us. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Wapner. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Um, it's being the Hilton Chair is a real a, a real honor. Um, I got to come here for a week in the fall, and then I get to come here for a week in the spring, and um, I feel like I've made friends, and so it's a really it's a, uh, I'm honored to um, to be the chair. Um, I, I do remember though that when I spoke here in um, in the fall, my lecture uh, overlapped uh, with the first presidential debate. Um, and, uh, and tonight it overlaps with the uh, State of the Union, so I don't know what that means. Uh, I don't think Obama has my cell phone number, but, um, uh, but and also actually uh, Secretary Chu spoke this afternoon too on climate change, so uh, a kind of tough act to follow. Um, Actually, President Obama is speaking about the State of the Union, and on some level, uh, not to exaggerate, I want to talk about state of the planet. So what, what's going on on the planet? And it seems to me one of the most profound things that's going on is climate change. And so I'm going to be talking about climate change. And as you can tell by the title, I'm going to talk about climate suffering. Um, it's hard to kind of be upbeat about that. But I hope by the end that you'll see that there are actually things possibly to be upbeat about that. Um, so, well, everybody here, I'm sure, knows about climate change. And um, we know that it comes from the buildup of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And that the, um, the effects are profound. The effects uh, include uh, everything frozen on the planet is melting, um, uh, which leads to floods, uh, erratic weather, and so forth. And, um, and I, it's, it's always, to me, it's hard to appreciate climate change. It's hard to appreciate what's going on. And so I always struggle with this. But if I could just ask you for a second to blow on your hand and try to feel how much that weighs. Um, much of what's coming out of our, our breath is carbon dioxide. And I would ask us to think about what it would be like to hold a pound of, of carbon dioxide. And then I'd ask what it would take to imagine a ton of carbon dioxide. And then one could imagine a million tons. And I don't know if anyone's ever in their life counted to a million, but imagine a million tons. And now imagine a billion tons of carbon dioxide. And um, we are today pumping the equivalent of 34 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, this is increasing roughly 3% a year. And um, we know from measurements, if we go back to pre-industrial times, there was 270 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. And now we're at roughly 395. <clears throat> what does this look like? 
Well, as I said, everything frozen on the planet's melting. This is a, a picture of some calving going on in some glaciers. Um, uh, I thought this might look familiar to some of you here. Um, my understanding is that the state is, is still going through a significant drought, and we know that there's been droughts around, uh, around the earth. Um, this is a picture of, Secretary Chu showed a similar picture of New York. Uh, this was just before the Sandy Storm. Um, this is not a doctored picture. This is what it looks like. Um, so these changes, and I, I'm sure you're here because you recognize that these changes that are going on are immense. Um, they are, last, in my last talk here, I talked about humanity becoming an ecological force in its own right. We're told we live in a time of the Anthropocene where humanity is sort of a major signature on the geological age. Um, this is a civilizational challenge. And um, when we think about this challenge, uh, we often think about it in terms of, it's a, it, we could sort of define it in different ways. We could say it's a technological challenge, which it certainly is. It's a political challenge, which it certainly is. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm in a department of global environmental politics, uh, and we spend lots of time analyzing the politics of this. It's also an economic uh, challenge. Um, what I want to suggest today, though, is that it's also a, um, a socio-psychological problem, or there's an important psycho-sociological or socio-psychological dimension. And this dimension has to do with change itself. Um, specifically, it has to do with um, our resistance to change. And so I actually have a thesis. It's not very complicated, and nothing I'm going to say today is going to be very complicated. But my thesis basically is that a major challenge, potentially the major challenge to addressing climate change, uh, is our reluctance to embrace change itself. And uh, this is actually going to be my focus. And um, I would say we see this challenge, or we see our resistance to change, in two major strategies when we talk about climate change. Um, in terms of our responses to climate change, our main response is mitigation. And if you heard Secretary Chu uh, this afternoon, he focused fundamentally, exclusively actually, on mitigation. Mitigation is the uh, effort to basically reduce and ultimately stop uh, the emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. A fundamental challenge. Um, today, and today, and I, how, how many people went to the Secretary's talk today? Okay. Um, well, when we talk about energy efficiency, when we talk about energy technologies, um, these are mitigation tech, uh, strategies and their attempt to stop doing what we're doing, that is, they stop emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And again, we're putting 34 billion tons in. That's a big challenge. Um, this strategy has been our going strategy since climate change became part of the public imagination and the political imagination uh, from the beginning. It's hard to date when this is, but in 1988, um, uh, Jim Hansen spoke in front of Congress and he popularized climate change. Ever since then, the international community has been trying to uh, address this problem. And if we ask how we are doing at this, I don't know if you could see this, it's not a great slide, but um, in 1992, we had the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was the first time the international community agreed on trying to stabilize greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in 1997, uh, we had the Kyoto Protocol, which actually set strict, uh, or at least um, specific targets to reduce uh, carbon emissions. And as you could see, um, it seems like every time we made a commitment, uh, emissions almost went in the opposite direction. Um, now, our, our sort of... Uh, difficulty of addressing this problem has led to a second strategy, which is adaptation. 
adaptation is not trying to stop the problem per se, but what it's doing is to try to adjust ourselves to it, to minimize the, the sort of worst effects of this. And um, it's still happening, but we want to become less vulnerable. And we see this, um, I think I have a slide here. We see this with attempts to build seawalls, um, drought-resistant agriculture, the burying of uh, electrical lines so we don't lose electricity and so forth. So the attempt of adaptation is really saying, you know what, we're going to keep trying to mitigate, but let's face it, we're not going to get there as quickly as we think, and so we also have to adapt. In the 1990s, there was a big debate, actually, about adaptation. And um, many people argued, including uh, Vice President Gore, um, argued that we don't want to actually use adaptation as a strategy because that may give us a false sense of security. And it may make us think that we actually shouldn't keep trying to mitigate. Sadly, meteorological events overtook that debate and it became sort of not only unwise not to try to adapt, but unethical given the people who were going to be hit first and hardest. Um, well, what I want to suggest is that adaptation and mitigation, let's go back here, that adaptation and mitigation uh, are important strategies, but they're incomplete strategies. That they inherently resist the concept of change, and therefore I think are increasingly anachronistic for today's uh, world. We are entering a new phase of climate change. And I'm going to argue that this new phrase calls on us to release our grip on the status quo in the, in the, in the sense that I'll explain in a moment how mitigation and adaptation do this to release our grip on the status quo and move beyond a resistance to change. And what this new phase is, uh, as the title of my talk suggests, it is we are in an age of significant climate suffering. Um, uh, I'm not sure one has to look at pictures like this, but this is obviously a picture of some flooding. This was in Nepal. I'm going to talk about Nepal in a little bit. Um, uh, this, is, this is just pictures of some dr of drought around the world. Um, do people recognize this? Anybody? This is a non-doctored picture of what happened recently in Australia. Australia has been suffering from tremendous erratic weather, incredible heat waves, and this is a giant sandstorm that uh, blew into the northern part of Australia. Um, this is uh, the, the fires in Colorado Springs uh, that came close to us. Basically, what I would like to suggest is that the suffering that's going on now, it's, it, it's almost as if um, mitigation and adaptation were strategies for when we knew about the problem and we realized we weren't doing such a good job of addressing it. But I want to argue we're in a, we're in a, this is happening much faster than we thought and that we are in a time of significant suffering. Large swaths of the populations around the world are feeling this. For me personally, what I think about it is, I teach climate change, I teach in global environmental politics, and it's always been out there. It was happening to other people. It was happening on other, uh, other continents. And I feel like what's happened is, slowly, and actually not so slowly, it's been creeping in. When I saw the pictures uh, of, of uh, hurricanes of Storm Sandy in New Jersey, my son actually sent them to me. I, I, it was in, there were pictures of the East Village, and I thought they were pictures of Indonesia. I mean, this doesn't happen here. And yet it was happening and happening in a dramatic way. Um, moreover, this new phase that I'm, gonna, that I'm suggesting, it's just the opening chapters to the world we live in to this rapidly changing world. And so what this, what this concept of, what this focus on uh, climate suffering really is trying to do is to suggest that we need to mitigate, we need to adapt, but no matter how much we mitigate and no matter how much we adapt, there is going to be suffering. And there already is and it's inevitable. And how do we digest that? 
How do we make sense of that? And I don't mean to bum you out, um, but I don't know how to talk about this. I would say, and I, I'm a professor, I would say the scholarly literature on suffering, um, there is a, there's a need to kind of think about this in a scholarly way and in a practical way as well. When it comes to the scholarly literature, um, it's only, it doesn't have much to say, actually, about climate suffering. There's lots of literature on, on social suffering. There's lots of literature on uh, past um, events that have created lots of suffering. When it comes to climate suffering, though, it's treated as if it's residual. Now, what do I mean by that? It's treated as our number one thing we need to do is to mitigate. That which we can't mitigate, that's what, that's that what we... Yeah. Now that's suffering, right? Uh, that which we can't mitigate, we adapt to. And that which we can't adapt to, we suffer. As if it's a category that comes off the, uh, the radar screen. At the, I mean, it doesn't come off the radar screen. But it only gets on the radar screen at the very end. And it suggests that while mitigation and adaptation are about public choices and about power and about making decisions about the collective, when it comes to their, their inherently political decisions, when it comes to climate suffering, the political analysis drops out and it, we turn it over to questions of public health, questions of emergency preparedness, first responders, and so forth. It's no longer a political science kind of uh, uh, issue. It's something... Um, it moves into almost a sociological and medical um, uh, discourse. Um, and I think this is a shame because I think that suffering actually involves strategies of response. Um, I'm not real good at PowerPoints. I imagine one should have lots of PowerPoints, lots of pictures to keep it going, but bear with me. Um, so. What do I mean that suffering involves strategies of response? We tend to think about suffering as homogenous. That is to say, we tend to think that when there's suffering, uh, it hits everybody equally, uh, and that people experience it in the same ways. Um, but we know that that's not true. Different cultures and different people feel it differently. Um, and this feelings, these, these differences, are not just idiosyncratic, but they actually have patterns to them. So for example, we know that, uh, with, in terms of climate change, we know that the poor suffer disproportionately from the rich. They're at the forefront of this in terms of vulnerability. Um, I'm going to talk about Nepal in a, in a bit. Nepal is, is apparently number four in terms of the most vulnerable to climate change. Um, an extraordinarily poor country. Um, but it's not just that, that it's that the patterns of suffering also are, um, they, they say they're nested in social contexts that determine one's felt experience. For example, with Hurricane Sandy, I mean, there was media, uh, media comes in and it sort of tells the story. And people who are suffering actually are watching the media to figure out sometimes how they themselves are feeling. Um, this certainly happened in Katrina. Um, also, there's institutional requirements that actually partially construct how one feels in terms of suffering. There are, for example, uh, criteria. Who gets medical attention? Well, if I'm a victim, um, I want to kind of know that information. So when I show up, I say, yes, I am that kind of person. My victimhood is actually partially a political activity. Um, refugee status. When there are climate refugees, you have to fit certain categories. And that, I'm suggesting, is not just an objective or exterior um, phenomenon, but it actually is interiorized, internalized, and, uh, and so forth. And likewise, when somebody has to, as, as we're seeing right now with Hurricane Sandy as well, when you go for financial uh, compensation, uh, you have to be a certain kind of victim. You have to have lost certain things. And again, I want to suggest that suffering is politically structured. It's not just a, um, uh, it's not just a blank slate and homogeneously experienced. In fact, I would argue that our inner experiences are instrumentalized 
by discourses of climate hardship. Now, it's these thoughts that, um, that have suggested the following, that um, in the same way that there was a recognition of the problem which led to mitigation and little progress led to adaptation, I want to suggest that suffering also has a strategy that may make sense, and I'm going to call that strategy radical resilience. And uh, before explaining actually what radical resilience means, um, I want to talk a little bit about how the idea came about, and that might be one way to explain it. Um, I said I went to Nepal. This is a picture of uh, the Annapurna region, uh, obviously in the mountains. Um, and uh, as you can see, the, they call this the blackening of the mountains. That is to say, it used to be, if you talk to villagers, that used to be just a blanket of white. And as, we, uh, and as time has gone by, there's been melting and, and so forth that's changed that. I went to Nepal because I wanted to know how people are living through climate suffering. I wanted to know if this is, if this is what's really happening, how do people feel it? How do they experience it? Um, and Nepal is a, is a fascinating country, it's a beautiful country. Um, it's one of the poorest in the, in the world. The average income, the average annual income is about $600 a year, which means most people are living on, a, on at or below uh, $2 a day. Um, their contribution to the problem of climate change 90% of their electricity comes from hydroelectric power. The rest comes from um, uh, burning firewood, biomass, and so forth. Contribution, nothing, a fraction. Um, uh, and yet, because of its typography and its uh, location vis-a-vis -vis the monsoon, climate change is changing the monsoon. So actually, the monsoon comes a little later now in Nepal. It's a little weaker but it's much more erratic. So you get massive rainstorms in one area, and in a whole other area, you could have a drought. Um, this is a picture of some uh, up in the mountains, and you can see these villages, they're just, they're just perched on the side of a mountain. So when there is heavy rains, there are landslides, and villages get washed away. Many people I talked to were terrified of their villages because they'd seen it happen uh, to others. Um, this is a bit, so I was both in the mountain region and in the southern region. This is a picture in the south in the Tara. This was a river that has just basically been uh, getting smaller and smaller as time goes on. When I was there, it was a place where people were just collecting rocks to uh, build roads. Um, again, this is a partially happening because of a changing monsoon. And just to kind of spin this out a little bit, uh, Kathmandu, which is the largest city in Nepal, um, this, it's predicted that this spring, because of reduced um, uh, rainfall, w uh, if, it, if it relies on hydroelectric power, um, it's going to have about four hours of electricity a day. Four hours of electricity to, to run a major city. Um, when I was there, uh, uh, the, you know, the lights went out a lot, the electricity went out a lot. I got to tell you, I brought my son, and a couple times I had to leave him in the hotel room, to be, and I went out and did interviews and so forth, and it seemed like every time I left him, within a half hour, the electricity went, and um, uh, he had to find other things to do. Um, uh, in the south as well, uh, the droughts have actually um, affected lots of crops. A lot of the people I talked to had lost their crops and lost their livestock because the first thing you do when you run out of crop is you stop feeding your animals. Um, uh, okay. What I found briefly, and I'm going um, to watch the time here. What I found in Nepal, though, in talking to people was I didn't always, what I expected to hear is I expected to hear um, that things are horrible. That, 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 that the dislocation that I've experienced from climate change has been horrific. Changed my life in ways that I would never have dreamed or never have wanted. And actually, I didn't hear that. I definitely heard people saying that they experienced hardship and heart-wrenching 
hardship. But, um, but there was also a strange and hard to sort of capture openness to people's future. When I would ask them in the interview questions, I'd say, are you worse off than you were before climate change? And I figured, and, and then, then my next question is, tell me how, list the ways. And I actually had people say, I don't know. I don't know if I'm worse off. There was almost an incalculability going on there. Um, now, when I talk to colleagues about this, and they say, oh, yes, 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 that's, um, that's traditional family, uh, I'm sorry, it's traditional uh, society fatalism. This is a term used in social science where it means that certain people are uh, culturally prone to be fatalistic. Usually they're poor. Usually they've suffered lots of hardship. And so they just, whatever. Um, I don't think I heard just that, though. I'm sure that was there. But I heard something more. And what I want to suggest is I heard this concept of radical um, resilience. Now. Resilience is the idea that we bend with change. Uh, reeds. Uh, reeds bend in the wind, and if they're resilient, they bend without snapping. The human body, the human body um, experiences shock, and if it's resilient, it comes back to equilibrium. That's what resilience is. Um, now, many people have used the concept of resilience to think about climate change. And the idea here is that we want to build infrastructures that actually do the same things. We want to build infrastructures that can bend with the shocks of climate change, but then come back to equilibrium. Uh, one definition, as you could read, the capacity to experience shocks while retaining the same function, structure, and identity. Um, there is a certain sense in which resilience is about bouncing back. Um, well, I think this is a really important concept and very important for thinking about climate change, but I think it's limited and I think it's incomplete. And that's why I've added the word radical resilience to this, because there's a difference. For me, radical resilience is not just bending so that we can recover, and reestablish the status quo, but radical resilience is about changing. It's about evolving. It's about transforming. I tried to find a slide for this, uh, not a great one, but the best I could come up with, something to show that where change happens, is this concept of evolution. Um, and here what I'm talking about is not just bending and coming back to the status quo, not just obviously mitigating or ad adapting, but being resilient in a way that one goes into change, in a way that one lear is learning, one's adjusting, and ultimately one is transforming. Now, in Nepal I met um, many people who had lost homes, not many people, I met some people who had lost homes to landslides. I met quite a few people who had lost crops, uh, corn crop mainly, um, and I met people who lost livestock. Um, and again, as I said, in my interviews, they said, yes, things were tough. There was no question they were tough, but they weren't categorically horrible. There was a sense in which um, uh, people had lived through tragedy, but had come out the other side but they came out the other side different people. And sometimes, and I hesitate to say this, but sometimes possibly in their own estimation, better people. Now how can that be? Um, I heard stories of people who um, said that they were forced out of their homes in the mountains and had to return and had to go down into the city, but had found different opportunities. Um, one of the things I heard most was people saying, gosh, I had to really work with my neighbors and get to know my community because people had social networks that came about to uh, support each other. Um, stronger communities was probably one of the biggest things that I heard people talking about. And what I want to suggest is that this is not about retaining function, structure, and identity, like the concept that I read about, but it is, as I said, becoming different people. So let me draw out this distinction. 
So if mitigation is about, right, preserving the status quo, we want to stop the shock, stop, stop putting more carbon into the atmosphere so that we can continue our lives the way they are. And if adaptation is mimicking the status quo, that is to say we're going to take things, um, we're going to uh, adjust ourselves so we can keep doing what we're doing, but we're going to make some small adjustments so we don't feel it as much, seawalls and uh, uh, drought-resistant agriculture and so forth. Um, and if I'll call it conventional resilience is bouncing back to the status quo, all of these are about trying to stay the same. Radical resilience is actually something different. It's absorbing the shocks and changing the status quo. Um, okay. Uh, let me hold off just a sec. Um, I want to suggest, though, that this is not something obviously unique to Nepal. Um, it's that this concept of radical resilience, I think we see it in many places. And one of the places I saw it is in my classroom. Uh, I invited a speaker to come talk about climate change once. And he got up, and he, uh, a little older than me, and he asked the class, first thing he asked the class, he says, how many of you are concerned about climate change? And every hand went up. And he said, how many of you are worried about climate change? And most hands went up. And then he said, how many of you are freaked out about climate change? And virtually no hands went up. And it was a strange, you know, um, this is anecdotal evidence, right? This isn't killer data. But, um, but what was that about? And when I talked to the students and we sort of thought about it, um, there was a certain sense in which, at least my students, and I have to say they're a self-selecting group. They took a course called Global Environmental Politics. But what they did, what I, in talking with them, what I've learned is that, and I don't know if you, if you students share this, but it's a sense in which living in a moment of climate change is not just about retaining the status quo, but my students feel like they actually want to be changed by the challenge itself that the challenge itself is a meaningful way to engage in the world and that um, they're not just seeking comfort and resisting change, but actually they are, um, uh, they are embracing change in a worried, perceptive way. Um, let me say this in a different way or, or try to spin this out a little bit. What my students feel, and what I, what's behind this concept of radical resistance, is that the status quo, if you think about it, right, the status quo is, is not the best of all possible worlds out there. The status quo is racked with injustice. It's racked with inequality. There are inhumane things going on in the world. And so for students, at least my students, there was a sense in which, what else do I want to do with my life except to work on this and take it to a new place, not to simply preserve the status quo? Um, now, I want to say something really important, which is that in suggesting that there's a concept of radical resilience, it's not to say that we shouldn't mitigate or adapt. We absolutely have to. Um, but it's to see mitigation and adaptation through a different lens, one in which sees the um, possibility that climate change is an invitation for important change. Um, okay. Uh, now, I've been talking very abstractly. I want to go quickly, and I, 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 am I running out of time? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I want to, so I've been talking in abstractions. I want to talk about what this would mean in terms of strategies for addressing climate change. And I want to make some distinctions. This is one strategy that people talk about for addressing climate change, a concept of clean coal. That what we're going to do is we're going to keep burning coal. We're going to keep mining coal. We're going to keep sort of getting rid of mountaintops to uh, get at coal. But what we're going to try to do is we're going to send the carbon, we're going to sequester it into the earth. We're going to dig big holes and we're going to put it down there. Um, this is a strategy. It's a, it's a bona fide strategy technologically. I, I imagine it's fascinating to work on and so forth. To me, though, this strategy is sort of emblematic of holding on to the status quo. Uh, 
It's we don't want to really change much. We certainly don't want to change our lifestyles, so we'll just get rid of the problem. It's kind of like we'll send it out into space, but this time we'll send it underneath. Um, and I want to compare this to a different strategy, which is, uh, in this case, solar energy. This is what the Secretary was speaking a lot about today. And you could say that solar energy is also holding on to the status quo, right? We still want energy. We're not willing to sort of say we don't want energy. But it's got a transformative dimension to it. It's about changing energy systems. It's about decentralizing energy uh, generation, power generation. It is about, you could argue, it's about going from a throwaway society to a renewable society. Um, Thomas Friedman, I don't know if you've read his book, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, he makes this distinction between uh, power sources from heaven and power sources from hell. And uh, those from hell are sort of the ones that we have to dig up and sort of use up and burn up, or ones from heaven, which, you know, wind and solar and so forth, that are actually infinite in terms of renewability. And I would suggest that this strategy is more in line with a resilient, a radical resilience because it's embracing change and it's finding opportunity in change. Let me give you another example. This is uh, Dauphin Island in Alabama. Um, Dauphin Island is uh, a, a small island. This is just a piece of it. But seven times this island has been inundated by storms. And every time, uh, flood insurance money has been used to rebuild it. Now, to me is a perfect example of this holding on to resilience. Now, it, it's, it's arrogant of me to stand up here and tell people who live in Dolphin Island that they can't rebuild. But a different model has just been articulated with Hurricane Sandy, where uh, Governor Cuomo said, you know what, I'm, we're going to try to buy up these houses these, these, these houses which are most vulnerable. And we're not just going to you know, stick the stake of the status quo deeper into the ground. We're actually going to move that stake and, uh, and, and move into to a different direction. It's letting go of an old model of how we should be and moving toward another one. Let me give you one more example. This is the border of, not a great picture, but the border between India and Bangladesh. And India has built a containment boundary um, because they're concerned about Bangladesh refugees coming into India. And this border has been beefed up um, self-consciously or deliberately um, with an eye toward climate change because Bangladesh is expected to have tremendous thousands of, of refugees coming in. This model is, is, again, to me, holding on to the status quo. I mean, if anything, this is like, you know, we're putting the stakes down and we're going to make sure that we can keep things the way they are. Um, it's a survivalist model of how to go through climate change. And, um, and we see other examples of it when uh, China buys up farmland in uh, Africa that's trying to sort of make sure that it has access to food. It's like building a gate around these areas. Um, and it's suggesting that I'm going to preserve my way of life, my consumption, um, at all costs. Um, a different model is a model which would say, rather than sort of shut out our neighbors, given my research in Nepal where people said they got to finally know their neighbors and work with their neighbors, a different strategy, one that is more resilient, I would argue, is one that actually doesn't build the borders up, but actually knocks them down and tries to work with the ability of society to shift. Um, one of the amazing things about fossil fuels is they have allowed us not to have to get to know our neighbors. I can sit inside, I can order things online, they show up at my door, I can just open the door just a crack to grab the package and shut the door again. Um, uh, and yet we know, the evidence suggests that actually neighbors matter. Um, in 1994, 1995, there was a heat wave that swept through Chicago. Uh, 739 people died, and uh, about 250 bodies were never uh, autopsies were not done. They did a they did an, they, some researchers went in and tried to see if there was a pattern to those deaths, 
and they found that two very similar, they compared two very similar communities, uh, both about 99% African American, both about the same socioeconomic status. But they found in one neighborhood, in Englewood, they had 33 deaths per thousand people. But in Auburn Cresham, Gresham, which was not very far, they only had three deaths per thousand. And they tried to ask, well, what's the difference? And what they found was the difference is that they had many less deaths in those neighborhoods that actually had strong community bonds, strong civil society organizations, and so forth. So uh, sociality matters. And I would suggest what I just tried to do is to give you sort of an example of strategies that are trying to hold on and strategies which are trying to transform. I'm almost done. Uh, I'll just make an analogy, a quick analogy. It's as if, imagine a sick person goes to the doctor and the doctor says, you know what, you've got a chronic disease. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you that. Well, there's some strategies of how to deal with that. One is one can try to mitigate it. And one should try to mitigate it. If, I wanna, um, uh, if I'm sick, I want to prevent myself from getting sicker. So, uh, you know, what that would be was to slow down and stop the assault. So if it's lung cancer, I should probably stop smoking. If it's diabetes, I should probably stop eating the things or sort of uh, do things that would sort of um, reduce that. In climate change, it's the same thing. We have a chronic disease and we should stop. We should use less energy. We should shrink our carbon footprint. We should mitigate. But using this analogy, one, if one's told that one's very sick, one should also, and, and we often do, we adapt. When I'm sick, I'll sometimes take an ibuprofen. It's a form of adjustment. It's a form of adaptation. It doesn't get rid of it, but it makes it a little easier. Um, it holds back the symptoms and allows me to kind of maintain my normal self. And again, with climate change, we see the same thing with adaptation as we build seawalls. Um, secure electric lines so we don't lose power, and so forth. But at some point in time, at some point in time it becomes clear that, in this dreadful analogy, um, that uh, I'm not going to probably get back to my normal self. I'm not going to be cured. I was, the doctor told me I have a chronic disease. Um, and so, uh, what it suggests is that potentially I need to grow into a new identity. It's not like I throw in the towel, but it's that I grow into wellness in a different way. Um, and I want to suggest with climate change, there's a new reality that's calling on us to develop a new identity, and I would say we need to recognize this. So let me conclude. Oh, I should have a couple slides here at some point. Let's see what's next. Okay, not quite yet. Um, so I want to suggest that climate change is, is obviously, it's huge, that uh, mitigation makes tremendous sense. Uh, I've got to say, listening to the secretary today, I wanted to say four more years. You know, he's stepping down, but actually he gets it. He understands climate change and so forth. But he's all about mitigation, and that's what he should be. He's the secretary of energy. Um, and... We should be adapting, but we should also recognize that no matter how much we mitigate and how much we adapt and no matter how sad it is, we should recognize this tremendous suffering that is part of our new lives. Um, Secretary Chu talked about opportunities and he was mainly talking about technological opportunities. What I'm suggesting is there may in fact be opportunities for human growth and human understanding. Um, we are going through a portal of climate intensification. Um, it doesn't mean there's apocalypse on the other side. I don't believe that. But it does mean there's going to be tremendous suffering. And the question is, how are we going to go through this portal? Are we going to go through it with dignity, with compassion? Are we going to go through it with survivalism and competition? This is where I think the politics of suffering is very important. Um, so the, the last thing I will say is this, is that um, talking about suffering is, 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 is not easy. 
Um, and I don't want to be Pollyanna-ish about suffering either. I, I don't want to take anything away from people who, who experience significant pain and who are su experience significant pain. Um, it, it's heart-wrenching. Um, but I think that uh, we're told that when something's heart-wrenching, uh, there's still options. One option is we can clench our, our hearts and sort of not fight the possibility of feeling the pain. Um, but we also know that um, hearts break. And hearts break in different ways. And um, sometimes the heart breaks and it shatters and someone spends the rest of their life trying to put the picture pieces together. Sometimes the heart breaks though and it breaks open. And there's a, an enlargement that goes on. And um, I think it's possible and it may sound shameful, but I think it's possible that as we go through this intensification, that actually, if we start to let go of our model of the status quo and imagine a different world and imagine the possibilities that are presenting themselves, I would argue we could have um, potentially enlarged collective hearts. And um, Two final quotes. The bad news is you're falling through the air. Nothing to hang on to. No parachute. The good news is there's no ground. And what I want to suggest is there is no ground. The ground is going. And so to hold on to it for dear life is probably not the greatest idea in the world. A significant obstacle to addressing climate change is our reluctance to embrace change. And that's just my thesis restated with a prettier picture. And um, and I just say thank you. Uh, we do have time, Dr. Wapner. We'll address questions. If you do have a question, please go to the microphone in the back, please. And queue there. Thank you. And I apologize for going over time. Uh, Apparently, you could. Right. So the question was, do I think the oil companies are holding on to the status quo, or do I think they are uh, uh, the epitome of re radical resilience? Um, th they are the perfect uh, illustration of desperately holding on to the status quo and spending tremendous amounts of money to convince the rest of us that it's not worth trying to change. It seems to me that the oil companies, I mean, some of them, not all of them, but uh, have been sort of funding the climate skepticism uh, efforts. And all they want to do, by the way, is sow a little bit of seed of doubt so we can sort of say, you know what, we don't really need to do anything. So um, sadly, I think that we tend to look at this issue through our, our interests, and I think that their interests are pretty clear. They would like nothing more than, I think, to mine and sell uh, coal, oil, and gas. Um, uh, I hesitate forever because nothing's forever, but I think that that's basically um, the viewpoint that they have. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, if we try to implement some of the things that the uh, uh, Secretary was talking about this afternoon and things you're talking about, we do it just as our country. Are the other countries going to join it? From what I hear, they're not really doing much, and I hear China's doing very little. And, uh, well, can we make a difference in the world if we just were the, we're the only country doing it? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. And one of the most difficult things about climate change is it's a classic what's called collective action problem, uh, which means that um, uh, it takes no one actor can do it on their own, and we certainly can't do it on our own. Um, but a key question is how do you get the collective to act? And... In international agreements, we have, there are some agreements out there addressing climate change, the Kyoto Protocol being the most important. Um, interestingly enough, the United States is not party to the 
Kyoto Protocol. So when we sort of say, will the United, what if the United States did it alone? Um, I wish the United States would even do just a little bit more to come into compliance with what many other countries have committed. Um, but the real heart of your question is, um, you know, what can a visionary, imagine we, we sort of get it and imagine that we're willing to put the money into it and imagine we're actually willing to do what Secretary Chu said and so forth. Um, would that sort of spark or sort of catalyze international action? Um, well, I, at a minimum, it couldn't hurt. Um, and I think that uh, modeling the kind of change that we're asking others to do uh, is, is more important than actually trying to force them to do this. The biggest problem, one of the biggest problems in addressing internationally climate change is that you've got countries that historically have pumped out, have burned lots of fossil fuels, and then you've got countries, underdeveloped countries or lesser or developing countries who got on that train late in the game. And um, as some people said, it's as if the first world countries went to dinner had a fabulous dinner, ordered hors d'oeuvres, had a salad, had a main meal, had dessert. Uh, that they invite the third world countries in for coffee, and they ask them to split the bill. <laughs> and um, in some ways, that's what a lot of the international negotiations are about. And you're right, China. China is the number one carbon emitter right now, per capita. Um, it's not the number one, but if you per capita, it's much less than that. Um, so the question is, how do we get such differentials together to address this? Um, in these international agreements, there are mechanisms to do that. There are grace periods for coming into compliance and so forth. But I think nothing will do this. I mean, first, I guess the real answer is, I don't know. And, and very few people know how to do this. And I think humanity has been struggling with collective action problems for a long time. But my own sense is that what I'd like to see is I'd like to see a global competition for clean energy uh, that actually sparks innovation and I think that the United States is as well positioned as any other country. Germany has made significant strides in this direction. Uh, some other European countries have. Um, I think uh, it's our economic future and so forth. Last thing I'll just say though is that having said that and we should do everything we can I don't want to lose sight of my point, though, that as much as we do that and as much as we adapt, we are also going to be suffering with other people. And I think that requires the United States also to take some other standpoints, not just technological, not just economic, but also ethical, and to, to, to increase overseas development aid to allow other countries who are bearing the brunt of our fossil fuel use to adapt in meaningful ways. Again, Nepal has contributed nothing to this problem, essentially, and yet is, is at the front lines of this. But thank you for a fabulous okay, question. I would just like to ask, yeah. comment one further point. Um, I have a lot of friends that are my age, and uh, very few of them believe in global warming, uh, climate change. They just say, oh, it's just a cycle we're going through. We've done that back in the 30s. We did it back in the 40s. And so if we don't all agree that it's a real problem, then it's hard for us to get together and have policies that we all support and then try to set an example for the world. So I'm just concerned about that. It's something to be seriously concerned about. And uh, in tonight's State of the Union, as it was pointed out earlier this afternoon, um, uh, Rubio, who's going to be responding to the president, doesn't believe in climate change. And um, what do you do about that? Secretary Chu said, throw more data at them. I actually don't think it's data that's, that's, that's holding them back. I think it's economic interests. And what they have to do, what we have to do is we have to change the incentive structure as we think about economics to make it clear that does Rubio want to hold back the country from making a leap into a clean energy economy in a post-fossil fuel world, or does he want to continue paying the high costs that are keeping us in this, in, in this uh, economic recession? I think that should be the argument. Um, please. You didn't say anything about the collapse of ecosystems that keep the uh, life on Earth functioning, and you didn't say anything about feedback loops like the release of massive amounts of methane if the permafrost melts. And I'm wondering why you said you didn't believe that it uh, was going to be apocalyptic. 
Okay, good. Um, so you're, you're right. I, I spent ver I virtually no time talking about the more than human world. And the more than human world, um, climate, um, in terms of the issue of loss of biological diversity, uh, we are told that there were five great extinctions in the world. The last one, the fifth one being the, um, uh, the 64 million years ago when the dinosaurs disappeared, we're told we are now in the sixth great extinction and plants and animals, whole species are leaving the planet at unbelievable rates. It turns out though when we analyze the causes of loss of biological diversity that people's conservation biologists are now saying that climate change is actually if not the most important um, cause of uh, loss of biological diversity, it's certainly up there. Um, so, so the question is, is right on. Um, uh, I, I, my only excuse is I just didn't have time to talk about everything, but I will say that um, um, I think some of the sadness uh, that we talk about, and in terms of suffering, by the way, I should say there's at least two kinds of suffering. There's physical suffering where we experience pain um, in terms of our nervous systems, but there's also existential suffering. And, uh, and I think that many of us feel tremendous sadness at the kind of holocaust that we're witnessing, not witnessing, that we are participating in to bring down um, uh, whole ecosystems. And um, I didn't mean to give it, to slight it, what I actually, I just didn't address it. The question about apocalypse, what I meant by that is I actually don't imagine, and I think it's a distraction to think that it's sort of, we're going to make it or we're not. Um, I think that life is tremendously uh, resilient. I actually think human life is incredibly resilient. And I imagine as we go through greater and greater climate intensification, there'll be sadly lots of loss of life, lots of degradation of life. Um, but I guess I don't concern myself, does that mean we're going to go into a, a, a human extinction? Um, I think that that concept of end time and apocalypse is a distraction because I think it leads to um, other kinds of thinking that I, um, I don't think are very helpful to the debate. And, um, and I would like to, for us to focus on the, the, the suffering that the human and the more than human world is going through rather than to kind of ask myself the question, is this the end of the world? Um, I guess I just don't do well with ends. Uh, but it sounds like you want to say something else. Well, I know people who are uh, expecting to see the end of the world, and I don't mean fundamentalists. I mean, I mean people who, uh, uh, if, if the if the I've heard that if the level of from Jim, I mean Jim Hansen. You could mention Jim Hansen. He says that if the level of carbon dioxide gets to such and such percent, which is quite within reach, uh, that life on Earth will become impossible. And I think that to not uh, put that out in, in, in the open is just another form of denial. It's like the, uh, anyway, I think you see what I mean. I do see what you mean. I appreciate the comment. I don't know, I, I, I'm not, I, I'm not a, a natural scientist, so I actually I'm certainly not a chemist, so I don't know, I don't know the, the dynamics of that. Um, I actually, of course, not knowing something as a professor just means you can actually say something about it. So I would say that um, uh, I actually think life, life, in some form will go on as there's lots of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, it may not be human life, but life will go on. Um, but again, a degraded life, and to me it doesn't quite matter if it's human extinction or if it's tremendous suffering. I think the response mechanism still has to emerge. Um, so anyway, but I thank you for the thought, and I'll continue to ponder it. Yeah, Clark. One of your questions, or sorry, one of your uh, claims about resilience was drawn from your interviews with people in Nepal and asking them how well off they are. So my question has to do with the answer that you get when you ask people how well off they are, mm -hmm. and whether that's a good indication of their suffering or non-suffering. Um, one issue that leads people to, uh, to say that they're doing well when they're not 
uh, is uh, adaptive preference formation, where people adapt their expectation. When, when, you, when you ask people how well off they are, they give you an answer that's reflecting their expectations of, 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 of well, well-being um, rather than their actual state of well-being. So in Bangladesh, women uh, reported being better off than men reported being, even though women were less nutritionally uh, uh, had less access to nutrition, mm. had fewer social opportunities, had no op op opportunities for employment, and by objective measures of well-being were, were worse off. So I'm wondering if something like that might be informing the answer you get when you ask people in Nepal, how well off are you, and has this made you worse off? Mm. That's a great question. And it, 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 it certainly interrogates social science methodology, uh, certainly interview um, methods, and we certainly know that <clears throat> people don't always even necessarily tell the truth. In your case, you're actually saying that they may be telling the truth as they see it subjectively, but as an objective measure, um, it doesn't match up. And I think that's a really important insight. Um, uh, in my interviews in Nepal, uh, certainly the way I phrase the question, the kinds of relation I, relationships I've built with people may in fact have solicited those kinds of answers? I don't know. Um, what I wanted to do with the interpretation of what they told me, which is different from what they told me, is I didn't match it to objectives to uh, non-subjective. I wouldn't call them objective, but non-subjective standards. But what I tried to do was to hear beyond, again, the social science literature, which calls it fatalism and to see if there actually may be some wisdom there. And, um, you know, people make a distinction between pain and suffering. And so pain is a kind of an inevitable experience that anybody, anything with a nervous system would, would go through. Suffering's a little different. People say that um, suffering is pain times resistance. That is to say that the way we, res that we have pain, but the stories we tell ourselves about the pain and the, the, the way we characterize ourselves as victims it enhances, this, enhances the pain, multiplies the pain, intensifies the pain, and so that suffering is that combination. And what I was trying to possibly falsely read into what I was learning in Nepal was that um, to hear how some people didn't seem to have a lot well, the, there were different levels of resistance. And some people, it was almost like partially they've been beaten down so much that there may not be anything left to resist. But then there were other people who were alive and who were, uh, I mean, we have this notion that happiness has to, and I'm sure you don't agree with this, but you know, happiness has to have a house and, and water and electricity and an iPhone and so forth. And I was meeting some of the poorest people in the world who were happier than some of my dearest friends. And they had very different conditions. Objectively speaking, if I ask the two, should I, is it fair to say that they're not really happy because they don't have all this stuff? Um, not really, but I was trying to read something else into it. Something that I actually think we could learn from. Um, uh, you know, Adley Stevenson, some, somebody went up to Adley Stevenson and said, talked about, does the, um, I was talking about the third world and the first world, and he was talking about technology transfers, and he said, you know, the United States needs a technology transfer from the, uh, I'm sorry, needs a, a new technology, and he basically said it would be a hearing aid to hear the rest of the world, and to hear that it's possible to actually live differently and to have a different relationship to change than um, we necessarily assume. But I appreciate the question, and it's, um, it's a big one. So thank you. My question is, do you have like a blueprint or like an idea of the way that we could slow down climate change without ending up like on the opposite end of a, the spectrum with like our planet being too cool? Too cool? Yes. Mm. Um, um, that's a good question. Um, uh, right now, the, the data suggests that there's not, the, the question of getting too cold is, is really not a possibility. 
at this point. Geolo I mean, geophysically, we are just so far off the mark. As I, as I suggested, before the Industrial Revolution, when um, temperatures were a bit colder, but not much, about uh, you know, less than a, uh, a degree centigrade, um, uh, we had 270 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. Right now, we have 395. Scientists tell us that we have to um, uh, reduce our carbon emissions in the north by about 80 percent to stabilize climate. That's just to say we've got to reduce 80 percent just to keep the climate stabilized. Um, we're not going to come close to that. In fact, the Kyoto Protocol, which is sort of the most forward-looking thing, it's about 4 percent. We're going to reduce below 1990 levels. So, I mean, where, where scientific sort of necessity is and political possibility is, or, or political, they're, they're in very different places. But um, my personal dream is I would, I would love to transition to a post-fossil fuel economy. And I don't think there's any fear that the planet will get too cold. I think that the, um, I think we could do that and, uh, and we've got a shot at stabilizing climate rather than too cold. Um, but it, I, I think it's, it's an interesting question because I think there was early speculation that these changes may in fact lead to global cooling. Um, and there was a movie that sort of, uh, I forget the movie, but uh, sort of dramatized that. But that's um, pretty far from where the science has come, I guess I'd say. But thank you. Um. Uh, when you were talking about the radical resilience, I was just wondering if, uh, when you were talking about how the island in Alabama that gets washed away and then they rebuild it because they want to hold on to what's what's they're used to, what they know, I was wondering if you think there's any correlation between um, parental and like school guidance that teaches children or you know students that we should stick to what we need, and do you think that we need to? not necessarily be taught, but be shown, I guess maybe the same thing, to that you know, climate change is a real problem and we need to learn how to um, either adapt or figure out how we can make our lives better and one person at a time make the climate better, quote uh -huh. unquote. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. I think that that's, um, it would be really terrific if we could cultivate um, the virtues that are appropriate for th this climate changing age. And I think some of those virtues would be ones that would, fl that would talk about human flourishing through, um, through reorienting our concept of change. I think we are mostly educated to say the world is pretty good, um, it's implicitly we're, we're taught that it's, it's generally ethical. Um, I'm, I'm talking we in the rich north. Um, and that um, what we should try to do with our lives is to jump deep into that system and drive that system even further because our own happiness is, is hooked up with the success of that system. And I think what we're seeing, certainly if we look at indicators of happiness over time, is that that system is it's certainly not making everybody happy. It's certainly not materially treating everybody the same. And it's increasingly, um, uh, I mean, it suggests, the, the sort of development literature suggests up to about $13,000, your happiness jumps up as you go higher to about 13000 About 13000 actually, your happiness kind of levels out. According to Bill McKibben, he says that uh, they did a survey, uh, they, they've been doing these happiness surveys for a long time, that um, the uh, top people in the Fortune 500 have a happiness quotient, quotient about equal to the Amish. And if you think about that, like, so why are they trying so hard, you know? But, but, but on the other hand, what's interesting about that is, what would it mean then for us to educate ourselves to take that seriously and to take the the thrill that I think we really do get as a species of helping each other out, the thrill of engaging in a civilizational problem and recognize that that could be a tremendous route to joy and to human flourishing, 
And that would include then releasing our grip a little bit at least on what is and try to orient ourselves to what should be. Um, I want to say one more thing though. I don't want to be naive and suggest that, you know, just sort of let go of the status quo. Like I have a family. It's not like I just want to say, you know, later. Um, but I do, th so, so I mean there's, I mean in some ways I don't want to sound disingenuous. I think it's a complicated uh, um, endeavor. But the one thing we know about the world is it changes. Phenomena, everything changes. So why is it that we built a culture that is, is like almost destined to try to hold on with every last breath? I think this culture would be so fabulous if we turned not just, if we didn't just live in a climate changing world, but we, we started to live in a climate resilient practiced world. That is to say where we actually practice this together. Um, turns out that actually in some European countries, uh, I think it's Sweden, but I, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, a number of years ago they were mandated to build uh, shelters, uh, for, for nuclear shelters, but also shelters from um, uh, natural disasters and so forth. And they were mandated to build shelters that held not just the amount of people that were in their family, but that could hold a few more. That's an amazing. That to me, that is a form of resilience, which says, you know what? It's not just me. It's not just my family. It's not just what is, but it's also what could be, and that's, I guess, the kind of suggestion I'm trying to make. Thank you very much.